All right. Um, so chapter two was sort of a review of the modeling process and how this compares to chapter three is that this section kind of introduces a lot of different techniques that we will use. The point is to understand the modeling process so that um, yeah, we can better understand it. Um, sorry, that was, you know, explain why and when to use those techniques. So the first thing is we we use the OKCupid okay data in this chapter. Um, and one of the main things that we do with it is we try to predict if a person is in a STEM field or not. That is the class fair variable. And in our modeling predictions or in our modeling process, we use some of the variables um, shown below, like day, age, diet, drinks, um, so on and so forth. There is a total of 38 variables, with the 38th being the um, outcome variable, uh, which is if they are in a STEM field or not. Um, and then here is a just more in-depth view of that OKCupid okay data. You can see how the class shows STEM or not STEM. Um, and these are just several different records. So one of the questions that we need to ask is how do we measure the uh, performance of our model? Um, what metric do we use? And that's section 3.2. Um, one of the regression metrics is root mean squared error, um, which Kuhn states is the most common metric used. Um, and it's essentially the average distance from its observed value to its predicted value. Whereas um, you take the squared um, difference for each, each um, observation, uh, observed value and predicted value, um, sum those squared values up and divide by n. That's sort of like an average, or it is an average. And then we take the square root, so the units are um, pretty similar. And then R squared, I just pulled a formula for R squared. Um, it's a squared linear correlation between observed and predicted values. You won't really see that from the formula posted. Um, but essentially, we want it the closer to positive or negative one, the better it is closer to positive one, the better it is. Um, all right. This is not a good slide. Um, so if the model has issues like nonlinearity, large variance, and outliers, then it's not a great model, or it's not a good metric for our, our model. Um, I kind of want to pull up the image that was posted in the book real fast, if that's fine. Oh, sorry. This is not quick, though. I apologize. Give me one second. Okay. Um, going to three point two point two. We have this um, data set right here about actual train ridership. And um, you can see there's sort of a, a bimodality to it. And in this case, we have a strong linear relationship. We would have a strong R squared value, but that's not that great of a metric to use in this situation. Um, and 
really you can see that it's just not that great of a predictor by looking at you know some of these outliers um there's um I should have more notes this way. I apologize. So anyways, there's also, if you take a look at this value to the right, which is a histogram of the residuals, you can see there's quite a few extreme values. Um, those extreme values are not really, the R squared value does not really explain those. They might be sort of brushed under the rug. You might have a high R squared value, um, as a result of, or well, you might have a high R square value and maybe that shouldn't be the case because you have those extreme values. Um, stop sharing. And the last, last sort of point in this with, with R squared is that it's a measure of correlation and not accuracy. So it's not predictive. It's a measure of how correlated are the predicted values for, the, for your model and the actual values. And it's not a good measure of how um, predictive future values are. So in this next section, or in the same section, um, we talk about alternatives to out or alternatives to R squared and root mean squared errors because they are sensitive to outliers and extreme values. Um, we talk about rank correlation, which is instead of you you rank the um, values from like one to forty, for instance. Um, just based on their numbers, um, you rank the predicted values and then you rank the actual values and then you take the correlation between them and that would be your metric. Um, mean absolute deviation and absolute error would be would be other ways to do that. And using the median, which is more robust to outliers than the mean would be. Just because the middle number isn't affected by one large number being, you know, 10 billion, if that were to be an extreme value. Um, in the next section, we talk about classification metrics. Um, whereas if you have a discrete set of values, categorical, things like that, uh, you'd want to use one of the two metrics listed below. Um, and one of the main concepts that we talk about is confusion matrix, which is um, essentially you have your predicted results, which is a, can you guys see my mouse at all? Yes? Okay. Um, so you'd have your predicted results. Are we predicting a stem? Are we predicting another? versus the truth is the actual results. And what we want to see is a lot of stem and stem. Are we predicting stem when it's actually stem? Are we predicting other when it's actually other? Um, more of that we have, the better it is, the better our model is. And one of the methods that we can use is classification accuracy, which is just pretty much what I just said. Um, we add up the amount of values that are actually true so we would add up, if we predict STEM, how much or how many are actually STEM. And we would add, if we predict other, how much are actually other. And then we would divide that by the number of total responses or just the um, number of values that were correct and the number of values that were incorrect. Um, so this accuracy method, the, the problem with it is that we need to have equal amounts of each. Um, so for our outcome variable needs to be balanced. We need to have an equal amount of true and an equal amount of 
of, of false for whatever we're, we're trying to predict, an equal amount of STEM and non-STEM. Because if we have 90% STEM values in our data, um, then we can just, I can just say, you know, our model is that it's always STEM and I'll be 90% right. Um, and I didn't look up too much into um, Cohen's Kappa, but that was something that's also mentioned that would be a method that we could use to account for those class imbalances. Uh, just curious if anyone looked up into Cohen's cap or what it was. Did anyone? Okay. Um, and then Kuhn ends the chapter by just saying the metric you should be tailored to your underlying question of interest. So use an appropriate metric for your models. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about data splitting in chapter two. Um, and one of the most common approaches, which I, I haven't seen a modeling process without it really is just, you need to split your data into training and test data. And although formatted pretty badly, um, this chapter does answer, or this chapter answers, um, what is the split that we need to use? How much data do we use for testing? How much data do we do to use for training? Um, and it, the author sort of says, it depends. So how many predictors do we use? Or how many predictors do we have? Because you want more sample than predictors. And it, so it just depends on what, what your data looks like. Do you have a lot of data? Do you have a little data? Um, if you had maybe a less amount of data with few predictors, you might need a more, I don't know, it depends, more even split perhaps. Um, and then the other part this uh, chapter talked about was how do we split this data, which is random sampling, um, essentially, randomly selecting, splitting our data into the training and test set, and then stratified random sampling, which is um, we try to get a certain amount of random sample from each group. So if we had, for example, education, we would want to have or a, a model that depended on the variable education. Um, we would want to have an equal amount of, of records randomly sampled from, let's say, college-educated people to high school-educated people to um, postgraduate-educated people. And then I talk a little bit about non-random sampling. I can't think of a scenario like off the top of my head where that would be exactly um, useful, but depending on your data, it, it may be obvious to you that you may need to use a non-random method. Um, resampling. So this is sort of the chapter I'm kind of a little bit thin at. Um, yeah. And I'm gonna pull up an image real fast because I, I, I found an image online. I'm not sure if it's great to do. I'm not sure if there's any copyright issues with that. Um, but this is how I, I best think of, of what a v-fold cross-validation would be. Uh, let me pull that up. So essentially, you fold your training data into v-folds. And oh, this is a great picture. Um, essentially, what we would do is, I'm going to take this off, actually. I'm going to use a different one. So I'm just going to grab the one from the book. Which is a bit a bit complex, but well. Okay. 
So with our v-fold cross-validation, can you guys see that or do I need to zoom in more? Good? Okay. Um, essentially, we break it up into v-folds. This case is, is 10 folds cross-validation. We have 20 different samples and um, each fold contains, in this case, two of our samples. Um, and each sample is only represented once across our 10 folds. So we test our data or we train our data. Um, let me know if I explain this correct or incorrect. We train our data based on all of the samples that aren't these two green samples. And then we test our data and with whatever metric we choose on those two samples. So we do that for each of these 10 samples. And then we compare each of these 10 samples and we use the model that performed the best. Um, so that would be V-fold cross-validation. Monte Carlo cross-validation is pretty close to the same thing. It's still folding cross-validation and where we, um, we have 10 different samples with, in this case, the same amount of records. We still use two samples in each, or two um, uh, training set samples in each resampling. Um, but these are randomly selected. So each of these training set samples could appear across multiple different resamples. And there's, there's some benefit to providing some sort of randomness to this. I don't have a thorough explanation on that. Um, but yeah. Okay. And uh, the other thing that was illustrated, and this was the um, rolling sample. So in this case, we would. This is this is mostly for like a time series data in which say these training set samples were ordered um, in order of time. So this first slice would represent the first 10, would contain the first 10 samples in chronological order, and it would test on the two after that. And that would maybe perhaps be useful this kind of modeling would be useful for a um, something like a stock predicting or predictor of, of future values, any sort of model that would do that. I'll say I do not have just a comment, Ben. That yeah. last one um is is called the rolling origin forecasting, right? Yes. Uh, the one that you're showing there. Yeah. The rec uh, you, resampling. You're right. Uh, but it is in the section of rolling origin forecasting, 3.4.4. Right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, that one uh, usually is, is used in uh, time series. Yeah, just, yeah. just 
I okay. maybe interject here so that there is in uh, our sample a rolling origin function, but when it gets to tune grid in um, uh, later in modeling, I've I've had some trouble using this kind of this this mm -hmm. specific function. Um, there's sliding period, sliding index, and sliding window. Right. Um, I've had better luck with one of those three, depending on whether the data are in um, uh, like consistent days. Um, if if the data is irregular, then sliding period buckets them, say by month or quarter, right. or, or, or sliding index will take batches of them, you know, 20 at a time, and you, you define the number. But um, I, I had some trouble using rolling origin. And I wonder if, if, if that was maybe a little bit older, um, as, as a, at, at least in the tidy models framework, if that was superseded by sliding period, sliding index, and sliding window. Um, so if, 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 if you're in tidy models, which was after this book was written, <laughs> that, that, that may be helpful is to look into those three other uh, R sample functions. The thing is, I, I just wanted to mention, and um, you know, that, that's a good comment, uh, Jim. I just wanted to mention that the constraint here is the, is the time sequence, right? Okay, you cannot do what you do in your regular uh, data set that you can shuffle, you know, all those observations and try to, you know, reduce the bias of selection, you know, in, in your model. Uh, here, you have to be a little more creative in terms of you have to maintain that sequence of, uh, of, of, of observations. And then, you know, that there are different, different um, approaches here. You can do it, you know, as a rolling origin, or you can do it by blocks, okay? You know, by sp splitting that time series into blocks with a training and a test in each in each block. So th there are different ways to do it. And I don't want to get too, you know, into the weeds, but there's a way to remove that temporality, okay, factor, mm -hmm. because that temporality is because the sequence of time or dates, right? You know, you have a date for, let's say, uh, one month each day, right? So what you do, you know, to to get it to a machine learning uh, model, uh, regular machine learning model like SGBoost or any other model, what you do is that you extract that temporal uh, information, you extract it and, uh, and create new features. For example, you extract the year, you extract the month, and you extract the, the day, for example. And then with that, then you can model and then do the, you know, the, the regular uh, resampling and cross-validation that you do in your tabular data. But if you maintain that temporal uh, variable, the date, for example, or the time, then you are stuck with doing one of these, one of these methods that I, uh, that I mentioned, uh, you know, rolling origin, uh, block, uh, splitting, et cetera. Uh, we were discussing that precisely in the in another book club, the the you know the time series uh, forecasting uh, book club, and 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 there was a you know there was a concern about that you know in terms of you know the 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 rolling origin sometimes you know gives you like Jim said gives you irregular uh, you know ir irregular patterns you know within each of those uh, each of those blocks. Uh, depending on you know se several circumstances, so one way to do it is just try to remove that temporality, get those features in your model, and then you can compare. Maybe that model will perform better than a regular you know uh, forecasting model. But, but it's a it's a special case. You know this one is a special case because of the temporality that that sequence that you have to maintain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think I actually, I think my bootstrap slide got cut off, which wasn't too large anyway. Um, so let me, it's essentially just a, a simple random sample of the, um, 
where you sample with, with replacement. So you can get the same values in your in your resample of the data. Um, I'm a bit confused as to the um, this graph, I, uh, the replicates, does that just say how often each of the sample is represented? Yeah. Okay. So it's like if you've got a super small data set. <laughs> um, yeah. You're, you're, you're backed against the wall and you got so little to work with. So you would just bootstrap to um would you would you bootstrap the training set and bootstrap the um I feel like in the uh in, in cross validation you had a a folds where you were um you would do your analysis and then you do your assessment to compare the um to find like a an AUC or whatever metric that you need. Um, for I, for the bootstrap, would you do this essentially the same process? It's it's funny the it isn't often I've seen this, but I remember in school, the data was so small you wouldn't even do a test set. It was like, um, you, you just you, your your the samples is so small, you you want an indication of feel, like a, a Bayesian feel of validity. But without even doing a split, you do this, and it gives you some, um, you know, sense of your your statistics um, across the resamples. Then, then, then your um, the spread of your statistics is is still somehow represented. But it's if it's it's if you've got like dozens of rows or twenty rows um, instead of thousands. So you, yeah, okay. So this would be very, very helpful to use when your data is small and you need, you know, more, but in a, in a statistically valid way. Yeah. Um, then. Yeah, a little, a little, a little comment. He says, uh, uh, he says when a bootstrap resample is created, there is a, a, like, a certain percentage, like it says, sixty-three percent chance that any training set members is included in the bootstrap sample, at least once. So it it is implied that you have a, a training and testing set, training and training and test set, and then when you do bootstrapping, uh, the it, it can happen that you the, the you might have uh, or, uh, almost all the variable within the training set and just very few in the test. Yeah. And then Ethan had a question in the chat. I didn't know. Um, yeah, I, it mentioned a couple things that you could do if you have small data sets, right? It, it mentioned leave one out cross validation. It mentioned doing tenfold five times, um, which I thought was really interesting. But it seems maybe maybe bootstrapping is, is better for that too. I don't know. <laughs> there's a lot of seems like there's a lot of options on the table for small data sets, and I know that that's a, such a big challenge. Yeah, that that's that's a challenge to. Usually you do cross validation, uh, tenfold cross validation, or but then then you can add resamples, and so you you like doing bootstrapping because you are doing random you are randomized things and with, but so it, it depends. But you you can try uh, with different resamples techniques and see how the results changes. But then the about the bootstrapping, it it continues and says uh, the bootstrap example is used as the analysis set and the assessment set. Um, so some you you have just as the same as uh, in the cross validation. You have uh, you you 
the the bootstrapping techniques treats your uh, training data as uh, split within uh, um, assessment and uh, analysis set. Analysis and assessment set. Yeah, just as this. Um, I don't know if this is a, I don't know if they say this in the book, but um, is one of the things I was just thinking about with bootstrapping is like, it seems like if your value is not in the original set of values, um, then you can't, your bootstrap sample won't contain that. Um, to put that in different words, if your original set of values doesn't contain a 10, and your values are eight, nine, 11, 12. Um, would you ever be able to predict a 10, for instance? That's that's kind of an odd question or not a great question because it depends on your model, things like that. I'll stop talking. <laughs> I can say that if your model is a, you know, if you're modeling a regression, probably you'll, you know, you'll get around there. Okay. Because regression usually is for continuous variable, but in classification, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe not <laughs> because you are, you're, you're trying to hit a class and if the class is not there, you know, in your new data, then, you know, how the model is going to, is going to treat that. Uh, yeah. That, that that's something that is usually found when you you build your model and you you know deploy it for example when you get new data that you get new information how does the model treat it if the, if the model is a good model that generalizes then you it can approximate you know some of the results but then probably you have to retrain okay because you have to incorporate a new new information uh the regression has that advantage that because it's a continuous you know, uh, a metric, then yeah, you could, you know, you could, you could hit uh, those uh, unseen targets in, in new data, yeah. Or, or an ordinal situation, but otherwise, right. yeah, it's, it's, it's right to be really, really, really and it, and suspicious. Even in the old, you know, you're going to be bound, yeah. right? For example, you yeah. have five classes, right? Okay, now there's a sixth class. I mean, the model doesn't know, really. <laughs> I mean, you have yeah. to, you, the, the solution is you have to retrain, you know, the, the, your, your model. And that's something that happens uh, quite quite frequently. It's not something abnormal. That's why, you know, there's this, uh, you know, this technique, what is called CICD, continuous mm -hmm. implementation, continuous uh, development, okay? So for example, if you have a recommendation system, it's a classification system, right? Amazon, for example. Um, they're doing a retraining of their data almost continuously because they want to catch you know those new insights you know from their from their from the data set oh yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's pretty weird it's, it's pretty weird yeah you know you're you're always retraining re retraining your model you know to capture that i mean we're talking about you know big big uh, big data sets here <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> No, that's not the right thing. Um, I essentially, I didn't, I didn't get to four six, three four six, and three four seven in terms of um, creating slides for them. I think I got to everything else, um, which is not ideal for the presentation. Um, and I can add into the slides later, but we essentially just talk about various and bias and resampling um and i i i'm not entirely familiar with the chapter actually which is kind of a bad thing to say but oh well um i'm sure it talks a little bit about the various and bias bias trade-off when you have certain types of models um I'm going to I'm going to move on. I'll I'll come back and add some things to the slides later. Hmm. 
So in 3.5, we talk about tuning parameters and overfitting. And we use the K nearest neighbors model um, in relation to housing data. Um, so essentially here, I just took the numbers from the textbook, which are, we have house prices. And our initial house price, 176, is is our what well, our like test house or our initial house. Um, and this house to the next to it is the house that is the nearest neighbor. Um, so if we were using a K nearest neighbors model to predict the value of this first house, we would take a look at the neighbor house, the if we had a um if we were only looking at one nearest neighbor. So essentially we would be predicting something, uh, we would have a pretty good prediction. Um, but that is not always the case. Um, for instance, let's say if we were to instead have our initial house be this 128 and we were to look at our, our neighbors next to it, our, our closest neighbor, which let's say it's either 175 or 100, um, then we would not have that great of a prediction. But if we were to take the average of multiple of these nearest neighbors in a geographical uh, location, um, then we would get something closer to the actual value of those houses in that neighborhood. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting, the example they showed. I think they said something about the error getting getting smaller and converging to like 46.4 um, as you get a larger K, but like the K actually gets larger with the specific example that they gave in the book. Um, or the, the error gets larger. So it, it essentially, it would be, I'm trying to think about this, it would be overfitting, correct? To, to use too small of a K and base your house's value or try to predict the house's value based on the house next door. Or as a wider geographical language or location would be a little bit better. Okay. All right. I'm out of order. Um, so we talk about the hyperparameter tuning methods. Um, we talk about grid search. And yeah. So in the grid search, we are using the OKCupid okay data with K nearest neighbors. And um, we use the following process to find the best value of K, which is we create a set of possible values of K. How many different neighbors are we checking? Are we checking one, two, three, four, five? Um, in our case, in the textbook's case, we're checking one, two, 201, but only odd numbers. Um, so for each value of K, you run the same crossflow validation and within that crossflow validation, you select the best model. So then you'll have, say, 101 different Ks, 101 different models to compare between. Um, between those models, you, for whatever metric that you use, whether it's area under curve in this case, um, you select the best of the best. So you can see the um, graphic in this case, the area under curve, and um, the higher that our K is, um, the better our a AUC is. Um, yeah, and I was kind of wondering about that actually. Um, and in some cases, I feel like the nearest neighbors maybe, or in the, with this housing data, it might not be 
too too wrong to say, but it, it feels like with the more KD you, that you have, does your um, ROC always increase like in this in this in this pattern? Do you, do you guys understand what I'm trying to ask? Can you can you can you say it again? Um. So, the more um K that you add to your K nearest neighbors model, does your um predict does your I guess predictive accuracy always increase? For can the be K can be can overfit as well if you do too much, but um. Uh, you know the the k uh, it's a certain number of uh, which is uh, you you don't need many you can tune it and the the and see around the, the, the with tiny models for example you can tune it and see or which is the best number of case. But um, I think it's usually between five and 10, isn't it? Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? The K number of, the K that we set. So the yeah. neighbor, yeah. He I said- can you, I can give you a different perspective of you know, your, your question. Because, for example, as you see that the curve moving to the right, you see a minimal increase in in the performance on the ROC, right? Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, tiny increments. So because KNN is usually a, a computive, com computing intensive uh, algorithm, you know, you need, you, need, you need resources, you know, to run this, uh, usually, if you if you are satisfied with a certain ROC level, let's say for example, uh, let's take let's take seventy eight, not eighty. Let's take seventy eight, which is a, a reasonable, uh, or could be a reasonable uh, metric. Then you can choose which is the one that gives me the least, uh, you know, the least the least K, right? You know, the 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 optimum K, uh, you know, to try to get a model that is more, uh, you know, runs faster. Okay. Okay. And and you can you can make that you know that uh uh that that assumption. Okay, yeah. because I don't think that you know you will want a model that is trying to get you know to the optimal solution, but then it you know it it it, it takes hours you know to to, yeah. <laughs> to do this. Uh, you don't yeah. want that. You don't want that. Okay, yeah. so you'll have to kind of tune your expectations with. You know the the complexity of the of the model, yeah. and K and N that's the problem. You know it gets complex yeah. every time you add another K. It gets complex. Yeah, I, I like I like to say that uh, here you can see that uh, if you, if you uh, if you see the 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 word picture, you you have the neighbors going from zero to two hundred. You know, but um, this line here is fifty. Okay, so before fifty, you see that. So you, you are doing a rock curve on a number of uh, neighbors. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a certain point, uh, it's stabilizing. And uh, this is the rock curve. So if you think about a rock curve, so you should select the, 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 the first, the, the, the top one. So like this uh, orange, uh, orangish, uh, the, the first one on top here, no? because it's a rock curve but in terms of a uh, number of neighborhoods things are different because you are not uh, so um uh, this the, this is the an, an, an average with a, a different number of neighbors so if you want to select one uh parameter that says uh, which is the best number of neighbors for my uh, for my model? You need to tune uh, and 
it really is a number. And that number would be the number that is uh, suitable for your data. Not always the same, but here is slightly different because you you are you have a rock curve. So you are tempted to select the the the, the highest level, uh, which corresponds to a certain different uh, average level of number of neighbors. So here, I think it, 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 there is a, a mention of hidden units. Hidden units are, yeah. Activation, um, yeah. Sorry. Where, where was the mention that you said? OK, um, I think it, it, here says that um, uh you can use different techniques such as uh nearest neighbor such as neural networks yeah um yeah yes so yeah and um it says that it depends by uh tuning parameters so it depends by your data so then you request your model to tune the parameters and then um you find the best the, the the best number yep okay he said then... that the curve used 201 neighbors with a corresponding area under the curve of 80 percent in totals are 200 of neighbors so this is the last point which corresponds to 200 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I'm um, I'm not um um I'm just gonna I don't have too much time, so I'm gonna try to just kind of look through the last couple. Um anyways, yeah. So if you have many tuning parameters. They talk about uh, a multi-dimensional grid search method um, where you are using the same data to um, tune the hyperparameters. Um, in specific, you know, we have three hyperparameters that you need to tune with this neural network. Um, one thing that you need to do or before starting the grid search um, is to truncate the range of parameters to reasonable values. Because I feel like a, a grid search would be very intensive depending on how many things that you need to try to um, tune. Um, and then even to fit the model, they use the RMS prop algorithm that would that also needs four additional um, hyperparameters. So in total, with all seven parameters, it's it's a lot. Um, so to select the values, they just randomly selected each value from a uniform distribution. And then for so many different iterations, in this case, they randomly selected um, 20 values for every single hyperparameter and ran those 20 models and determined what was the best, the model with the best day you see. Um, yeah. And then some other approaches are listed here that you can use for a hyperparameter tuning or um, yeah. um, I'm not gonna. So the last section or that I'm going to touch on is comparing models using the training set or um, comparing two different models. So sometimes we want to try different model types. And for instance, logistic versus uh, regression versus a neural network. Um, in this case, we use our tenfold cross-validation for each model. 
um, and calculate the AUC for each of our um, resamples for each model. Did I? All right, I didn't put a slide break in there. So I apologize for that. Um, Anyways, I was just going to essentially show this this graph that was listed here um, that we then compare the AUC for each model, our logistic regression, our neural network, and we compare the differences between the two. And um, if we have something, we can we can then check that difference column. And we can do something like a, a t test on it to determine if um, our difference is statistically significant. Um, if there is a difference in the models in one way or the other, um, and if if our t test or whatever model we use is greater than or shows a result, you know, if if our um, confidence interval doesn't contain zero in this case, then we would have a model that is, or you would be able to say that one model is different than the other, essentially. You are a certain percent confident that, or well, with a certain percent confidence interval. Um, yeah. Uh, 3.8 is just feature engineering without overfitting. This is just quick summary of that is that um, before modeling, uh, sometimes our, our data is, is odd and we should look for trends in exploratory data analysis before modeling. And that's sort of an introduction to chapter four, I think. Um, and a specific example of that would be, they talk about the Ch Chicago train ridership being lower than when, when the Chicago bears are on TV. Um, so that's not something that you'd be able to find in your model, but you would be able to, that, that's something that would impact your model significantly. Um, and in conclusion, it's just important to understand your data. If you understand the modeling process, you are less likely to make suboptimal modeling decisions with regards to things like deciding performance metrics, deci deciding resampling method, um, and then when choosing tuning parameters or in the, the process you use to decide to choose a tuning parameter. And that's about it. Apologize for going over time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So that, that, that was fantastic. Thank you, uh, Ben. Thank so, you, ben. yeah. Okay, so uh, we. Uh, meet next week with Ricardo in chapter mm -hmm. four. <laughs> yep. So look forward for, uh, to it. And um, that would be challenging with Chicago train traineeship. <laughs> yeah, let's see how we how we yeah. dissect that one. <laughs> <laughs> that it, that that you know can be can be explained. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to download the data. Yeah. Uh, need, also, yeah. I post I posted in the chat. Uh, yeah. You know, talking about metrics. Uh, there's a very good video uh, from the H two O guys. Okay, um, okay. on on a, on a metric metrics master class, and it's great because they cover a lot of the traditional metrics for regression and classification, and they give you the pros and the cons. So okay. it's it's a very good yeah. it's, it's a very good video. You know, to to watch and you know get some notes there. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Bye. Have a great weekend. Bye. 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 Thank you.